we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we're doing Community Matters today, 1 p.m. on a given Tuesday. Huh? Tuesday. And that's Tim Apicella. He is the host of Moving Hawaii Forward, which is a show about transportation. And this Community Matters show is going to be also on transportation in its own way. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much, Jay. Glad to be here. So now um, we, we named this uh, Tickets in Paradise. <laughs> Can you give me the scope of this discussion, please? I'm going to guess it has something to do with a moving violation. <laughs> but if it's not moving violation, maybe it's pertaining to tickets to the opera, movie theater. Could be. But since you mentioned transportation, I'm going back to moving violation. Yeah, I think would I be right. close to that? Yeah, yeah you would. Okay. I mean, tickets in paradise, like a great trade name for going to sell opera tickets, but not today. Okay. Today we're going to talk about speeding tickets and traffic tickets and moving violation tickets, and for that matter, pedestrian tickets, all the tickets we got. That's a very expensive one, by the way. I know it is. Not that I know for personal uh, cell experience. Cell phone tickets, you know. We got tickets. We are festooned with tickets. Our lives festooned? are festooned with tickets. Did you say festooned? Yeah. Festooned. I haven't heard that in a sentence in a long time, Jay, and That's I appreciate okay. you bringing that forward. I assure you it's politically correct. <laughs> so many words in our lexicon have gone outside of politically correct, but that one's still good. So a safe word. So, and we're talking about Oahu, not necessarily the neighbor islands, because, you know, you and I don't drive that much or spend that much time on the neighbor islands, and I we couldn't really state with any degree of familiarity what goes on in the neighbor islands. So let's talk about Oahu. Let's talk about what we know. Yeah, let's talk about it. having a million cars, you know, for one million people. Roughly it's one to one, which means a lot of families, um, you know, who don't have cars are counterbalanced by family who have too many cars. And let's talk about uh, electric cars. There's, uh, gee whiz, uh, maybe 5,000, 6,000 electric cars in a, a population of a million cars. What's wrong with this picture? And the number of bicycles and bike lanes is minuscule compared to the cars. And the cars, you know, are, are you know, stuffed into highways that can't hold them, highways that are not refreshed or rebuilt or remodeled or redesigned or even repaved. They're talking about streets that, have, that, that needed to be, you know, redesigned, you know, at statehood and haven't been. Um, we're talking about too many cars, too many people in too, too little space and too and, little space on the highways. And too many tickets. And too many tickets, <laughs> because that's what comes out of it. But we're also talking about uh, city government, and for that matter, state government, which never seems to have enough money. Okay, I don't know if that's the economy or it's just the way government works or the way the taxing policy works or the fact there are too many employees working for city and state, but they got a, a maw to fill. Okay, got to develop you know, a, lot of, a lot of revenue in order to fill that maw. A gaping maw. A gaping maw. So <clears throat> part of this, and it's hard to say exactly where it comes from because I can tell you, I can tell you that back at the time of, say, early statehood in the 60s when I first came here, there weren't so many tickets. It was hard to get a ticket. And if, and if a policeman stops you, you're more likely to have a pleasant conversation with the policeman than get a ticket. Uh, there were a lot more warnings in those days and a lot more, I understand your situation, and you could actually talk to the policeman. All of that, to me, is gone. But you're hinting at something, and that is budget versus tickets. And the correlation is, if there's a shortfall in budget, is there pressure on the uh, Honolulu Police Department to I'm not saying there's a quota, but is there pressure to generate revenue via the Ticket Avenue? I don't know. Yeah, and on the quota you know, thing, I've asked a lot of people, including former police you officers, you. Um, you know, people who know about what goes on inside HPD, and none of them has ever indicated to me there is a specific quota. On the other hand, um, I don't think you have to have a quota to have a quota. What I mean is there's a certain pressure going on. If I'm a cop who never gives a ticket to anybody, I get one, you know, level of credibility and You're not going to pass the sergeant's test. Right. And if I, if I <laughs> give a lot of tickets and earn a lot of revenue to pay my own salary, and actually it goes to the state, goes to this money goes to the state uh, and pay state state expenses I, I have a different you know position in my career and, and, and my sergeant's exam whatever my promotions Your performance evaluation gets that little check mark yeah I, 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 I believe that to yeah. be so and, and and what we get here is a, a more pressure on the average policeman to give tickets the other thing is you really wonder about about how the police are being deployed you know, they're supposed to fight crime. 
Traffic tickets, per se, is really not a big part of crime. Sorry. Crime is a big you part of crime. protect and serve the public. That protect, is protect and serve, and serve. the let's, let's emphasize that. Yeah. Protect and serve the public. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is, if, 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 do they have enough time, enough officers? You know, they're down officers. They're recruiting now, in case you're interested, Tim. Uh, I'm past my prime for that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, so am I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't run <laughs> nearly as fast as I used to. Past their prime <laughs> for that. But, um, you know, too few, too few policemen and um, more crime than they can handle. Crime in, a, in an overstuffed uh, island, you know, has got to be raising. It's just got to be increasing. And so are they out there spending their time on crime? I mean, I, I actually, my, my own personal experience is no. Uh, they, they do not feel capable of actually solving, investigating crime. I mean, if, if only 5.0 were true, if only CSI was, NS, what is it? NSI or and CS, sorry, NS, whatever it is, is true, you know, then they would be actually solving crime. I only watch crime. Big Tech Hawaii, Jay. I don't have time for all these other stuff. I know, I'm same here, that's so. why, yeah. But, but the problem is that, you know, how, how are you going to deploy, deploy your force? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got issues around, around the chief. And uh, who is the chief? And what happened to the chief? And the chief is fighting in court and trying to get HPD to pay his legal expenses. And I mean, the whole thing is a, is a blur about what's going on. You can only follow that kind of news for a while. After a while, you kind of reject it. I don't want to know yeah, about I've this. I've been overexposed to it. Overexposed. But you have to give policemen their due because they have a whole set, a set of rules now, engagement, rules of engagement that leads to potential litigation, not only for the officer, you know, on their, on their own, but also the department, the state, or the city. There's litigation that, you know, is so sensitive now that uh, you almost have to be an attorney to be a police officer. Well, a lot of them consider themselves that. You know? You know, but, you know what I, I would say, you know, th that's true, but uh, that's not, that's, you know. It makes your job so much harder. It reflects a certain amount of disdain, contempt for the police department and the mm -hmm. police officers. And I think they have, they as a group, have, they as a force, they as a department have isolated themselves from the public. If you go out on the street and say, what do you think of police in general? You're going to get a mixed bag kind of answer. Now, there's a physical environment that leads to that. And they've done study on the study and they know community policing is successful because you're out of your car, you're walking the community. Yeah, where the is more that? you put a... Oh, in Seattle, community policing. Well, it doesn't um, happen here. It's not a bad I, concept. I saw two it's not a concept. It's not a bad concept. Okay, then you have policemen on bikes. That's kind of a hybrid of, you know, a, a beat cop. You don't see many of those. You don't see many of them. But you, the point I'm making is, if there's isolation of police, it's because they're usually in a car by themselves or, you know, and there's not opportunity to engage with the, the population that they're there to protect and serve. That could be changed, couldn't it? It could be changed quite easily. I'm not police chief, though, and I'm no. not running for police chief. No, no, and I, I don't think you would. And I don't think there's really any leadership there right now. And so, uh, you know, and, or for that matter, in the state that, that, that supervises them or in the county that supervises them. So as a result, um, you know, there's no, there's no sort of persona of I'm here to help and serve. Right. I want to help you and more than anything. I want to help you. I want to help you have you have confidence in the community. Uh, I want to make you safe. I want to make you feel good about living here. May I pull up an analogy, a parallel analogy? If you're a lifeguard here in Honolulu County, and you know that your liability has been stripped away from you, are you still not going to go out there and save lives? Of course you are. Are you going to have that in the back of your mind when you have off time? You are. You're going to have that always in the back of your mind as to Am I going to be subject to litigation if, if something goes very awry on my, my attempt to save someone's life? Um, I don't think a policeman has any different kind of things on the back of their mind when they're trying to protect and serve, is that the constant fear of uh, being, you know, being caught up on some charge and litigation. I think that's why we're starting to see the concept of body cams. Body cams to, yeah, to, but it's happening on the to video has their interaction with the, the why public. Why hasn't it happened here? I don't know. And speaking of cams, you know, whatever happened to the whole notion of a van cam? That was an example of, uh, you know, the conclusion the police were not able to monitor speeding. Or well, for that matter, traffic signals. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the forces. They didn't have the political will. They didn't want to do it. The other things on their mind were probably giving tickets. Uh, and so, you know, as a result, we had a van cam statute that lasted within the same session. It was repealed in the same session it was adopted, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And we never got, we never got the first Did they say that was kind of a, an abuse of privacy? I can't remember the, the, the reason why that you was. Know, the, reason, the reason, which I, I don't buy before, at all. Before my time here. But. The reason for the demise of the Van Cam rule, I think, was that 
um, you couldn't logically be sure that the picture of the person you saw driving was the picture of the owner. And that's the okay. same argument they use about um, traffic light cams, taking a picture of a, someone who's entered the intersection when it's you know, in the red Yeah, in they the red know status. the car. They can't they associate. They know the registered owner of the car, right. but they don't want to give a ticket to the registered owner of the car or assume that the driver of the car was the registered Correct. owner. And that's why there's been a lot of litigation in Seattle that had uh, this intersection cameras, and, and it's been successfully challenged. Yeah. Well, I don't think it should have been successfully challenged. I think we could use that technology and that and, and other technology. But that would lead to the topic of tickets. It and, and, and it, did you get a ticket of late? Or? I got a ticket. And, a, and after this break, Tim, we're going to talk about your ticket and my ticket. Uh -huh. I don't have any tickets. Oh, yeah, I haven't had sure, a ticket in 30 sure. years. You're, you're under oath now. <laughs>
incident, they went to the legislature and got this statute that says violations of the code if, if you're too close through the flashing lights. <clears throat> and what it says is you have to move over the next lane if you can. If you can. And that leaves the discretion of the driver to figure out is it safe to move to the next lane. Um, okay, and what, what's really interesting about this is, that, is the officer said to me, you were within 15 feet of my flashing lights. I said, really? I, I didn't know there was a rule about 15 feet or being too close. I really didn't know anything. And after the fact, I asked a lot of people, do they know? And nobody I knew yeah. knows about this. And I went and looked up the code, actually. And uh, the code said, uh, you know, nothing about 15 feet. How wide is a car? Uh, gee, I don't know, six feet. That'd be two car lengths. In it, would be, it, would be, it would be more than a lane away. Yeah, but, but I have to add yeah. that the lanes in, in Baratania at that place are really, really super wide mm -hmm. um, because there's a bus stop and because there's a, there's a fire station there, the, the lanes are really super, this is right in front of the fire station, um, really super wide. And, and so I felt that I was at a perfectly safe distance and that I also felt that I, if I moved away from the flashing lights, it would not have been safe. So I just, you know, I kept going, essentially. Um, so, you know, what, 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 what bothers me about this is that it would be a perfect opportunity to educate me as a member of the public. I'm, I pay my taxes. I paid my dues. I'm older by twice than this young officer fellow, whose name I will not mention out of concern for That's his privacy. Uh, I asked him for his badge number, by the way, and he said, he wasn't going to give me his badge number, that it was written on the ticket. So I looked at the ticket, and Can't I didn't read, read the badge number. It's <laughs> like, it's this like is not legible. That's like you're trying to take a girl out, you know, and you say, uh, what is your phone number? And uh, she <laughs> says, it's in the phone book. And then you say, well, what is your name? So I can look it up in the phone book. She says, well, that's in the phone book, too. So <laughs> I walked away from that, and I, I didn't know who he was, really. Um, in any event, um, so that, that's my ticket, and I, and I felt that there was really no violation of anything, nor should it have been, and I felt that a warning would have been, or, or a kind discussion, if you will, a kind suggestion well, would have been appropriate. Protect means also a big part of that is to educate. Yeah, right, but that was nothing. He was really mean, and he was going to give me this ticket no matter what, at 11 o'clock at night, and I'm in pain. I'm trying to get to the Long's drugstore. I told him that, but it didn't seem to have much effect. And I, you know, came away from that experience thinking these very thoughts about how the police should be serving, protecting, helping. They're our friends, our neighbors. They should be kind to us. Um, you know, they should, they should. We pay their salary, man. Um, but that's not what I got from him at all. I was adverse to him. I was uh, tantamount to a criminal. Um, you know, I had done a really, really bad, morally reprehensible thing, and he was going to give me a ticket no matter what. He was angry, man. In addition to the ticket, did he give you uh, some choice words, or was it just the issue? No of choice tickets? words. Okay, good. Okay. But but he was angry, and he yeah. wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to engage with me at all. Oh, at, at one point, yeah, I, I opened the, the door to my car. I opened the door because I, I wanted, you know, to talk with him. And two things came out of that. One Stay is in the car. Stay in the car. And he barked it out at me like I was going to get out and do something horrible to him. Um, maybe that's the training. The training yeah, needs the training. to be more sensitive. Yeah. And the other thing, he says, huh, you're not wearing your safety belt. And I said, yeah, because I opened the door of my car. I'm going to get out. out. That's why I'm not wearing my safety belt. Yeah. Uh, he was going to try to nail me for everything he could. And, um, you know, it's an attitudinal thing that really bothers me about this. But you want to hear the second part now, right? I, I do want to hear about that, Jay. Absolutely. So a few weeks later, it's more like a month later, my return date, so I go to court. By the way, it was wrong. The date on the ticket was wrong. I had to go check and find out what the right date was, which is cute. So I go down to court on the day. It was a Monday morning, and I wait in this courtroom for some time. And the people in the courtroom, you know, like everybody's in Zori's. Uh, I was the only guy in business clothes in the courtroom, honestly. And, uh, you know, it's like another, the, other, the other half of the population was there. And, and um, okay, so I wait my turn, and um, the judge says, um, I won't mention her name in the interest of privacy either. The judge says, uh, how, do you, how do you plead? How do you respond to this ticket? And I said, I contest the ticket. I, I would like a trial, I said. I contest it. I like a trial. Not guilty, right? <clears throat> Immediately. Immediately, without taking your breath, she says, this court finds for the state and against you in this matter. Really? I just pleaded not guilty. How could you do that? You didn't take any evidence. <clears throat> and then she says, and I'm fining you $50. Okay? So that's, that's interesting, Judge, but, you know, 
I, I know enough to know that in this country, you on a trial, you get a trial. You plead not guilty, and you're not guilty until they prove with evidence. The cop wasn't there, so what's going on? She explains to me, no, I'm giving you an option. Really? Oh, now it's an option. Now it's an Before option. Before it was a verdict. Before it was a verdict, now it's, <laughs> now an, it's option. an option. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to pay $50, then you can dispose of it that way. Um, if you want to have a trial, you can dispose of it that way. If you want a trial, you have to go tell the people outside in the clerk's office that you want a trial. You have to tell them your decision in this matter. I said, well, you know, I, I already told you, didn't I? I had a record and all this in the court. Well, no, you have to tell them again. Interesting. So, okay, I paid the $50 as well because I couldn't stand being there. I, couldn't stand, I couldn't stand You had there. a certain level of indignation, a certain right for a, a trial by a <laughs> jury of your peers. No jury. No jury. No jury. No jury. No jury. But the bottom line is you capitulated and you paid the fine. Yeah, I'm not proud of that. Ah. But I thought you just—I thought you were going to tell me a story didn't, about how you went to the trial. To back because the whole experience in that courtroom was slightly bizarre. So they won. Now, mind you, I've been in court through a long career in practice. The system and won, J zero. The zero. system lost because I walked out of that place, and I've respected the law. I'm very patriotic, very faithful to government in general. I consider myself part of government. Government's part of me. I'm in the social governmental compact all my life. I served in the service. You know, this is the way it is with me. But, but I lost confidence in the system that day. So what is this? This is, you know, this is in violation of everything I've learned in school. And uh, what that cop did is in violation of everything I expect cops to do uh, and care about. Uh, the, the whole system was screwball. And I, I'm here to tell you that um, what lost that day is the system lost my respect that day. That's what I'm here to tell you. But you said that day. It'll be back for another day. I hope not. Not that you're going to you know, be written with an infraction, but the system has to work. It has to well, be, no, I, it yes, has to have some credibility. Absolutely, so. the system needs to be improved. <clears throat> right. You know, those, all of those things could be, should be, absolutely must be improved. Now, when I went to traffic court, and um, oh, I you certainly... It, you admit it. Ah, I said I was never found guilty of an infraction. I didn't say I didn't receive one. Okay, so you're an oh, attorney. You're an trial. attorney. <laughs> you understand these things. <laughs> I went to traffic court to basically do what you did. And um, what I found was interesting is the bailiff, which I don't remember his name, and if I did, I would want to keep it private anyway. But the bailiff tried to discourage me from even going up before the judge. He looked at my ticket. He goes, and I won't, re you know, I won't try to imitate his, 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 his accent, but he said, they got you. Why are you here? They got you. Why are you even wasting your time coming to this court? And my response is, we'll see about that. All right. What okay. happened? Well, you know, I did my best Bill Clinton indignation, crooked finger, doing this that I've never had a moving violation in 30 <laughs> years, and I did not commit this infraction. And, you know, it went on and on. And clearly the judge was not amused, but thought it was half worth listening to. And uh, what saved the day was that when you receive uh, a speeding ticket, and it's, if it's not by radar, but uh, you're actually being paced, uh, it's advisable for the police officer to write the exact speed of that pace, not a range. And what I mentioned to the judge was, if I'm guilty of speeding, I'd like to know precisely what speed I was going at, not a range of 35 to 50. By the way, I was going 50. Um, but she saw the point. It's a good thing the statute of limitations is <laughs> passed correct. on this. <laughs> she came down with a verdict, and I was not guilty. Absolutely wonderful. Now, on the way out, the bailiff said, good job, bro. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well. So but the point is, I didn't pay the fine, and I wasn't going to pay the fine. I was going to argue to the nth degree. Well, I guess you have more time on your hands than <laughs> I do. That was the issue. I wasn't going to spend, you know, waiting. I was waiting for the, this arraignment affair. Then I was going to have to wait again for the trial. It's going to muck up my calendar forever. And I don't have the time for that. Now, you know what a lot of people do. In fact, on this day that I did go to traffic court, a lot of people, um, sub, not subpoena, but they request the officer to be present during that, that hearing. And what they hope for is that the officer has way too busy and uh, doesn't show. Because traditionally, if the officer doesn't show, the ticket's usually thrown out of court. But this particular judge said, if there's anyone in this courtroom who has subpoenaed, or not subpoenaed, but has asked the officer to come here, and if that officer's not here, we will reschedule. 
And if they don't come the next time, we will reschedule again. It happens. So it happens. doesn't give none of this gives you high confidence, you know, in that system. But I want to tell you the capper though. The capper, there's more. So I go outside, I think about it, I scratch my head, I get a headache thinking about this, but I gotta get out of that court, that courtroom and that court building. It's really not a place you want to spend any time in. I don't want to go into detail, but it's really unpleasant to be there. So I go out, I go out, yeah, I mean, what Sounds like a table of horrors. What? Yeah, really, <laughs> to me it was, and, and, and I practiced law for 50 years in this state. Um, so, so I go outside, I go to the cashier's window. It's not $50. It's not $50. It's $92 or $93. I can't remember. Okay. What's this? Que pasa? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so, well, there are extra charges on top. There's the this fees. fee and the administrative fee and that fee and a number of charges. And that's how the thing gets almost doubled between the time you're in court and the time you're at the window. I said, really? You know, is this a rip or what is this? This is not what it's supposed to be. And I, and, I, and I must say that I came away with a further level of, you know, discomfort about how the system works. Somebody should change the system. Somebody has to look into this system. I don't know whether it's a police commission or the state, the state legislature, or HPD itself once it gets back on its feet. But somebody has to look into this. You know, law-abiding citizens should not be treated this way, either by the police or in court. We should have a good experience, not a bad experience. Uh, we should find people who understand and want to understand what happened, uh, not hand out these, uh, uh, why don't you kick yourself in the, in the alcoholic kind of results. Um, so that's, that's, my, that's my bottom line on this. Uh, uh, oh, for the good old days when the police actually talked to you. Oh, for the good old days when they weren't so angry. Oh, for the good old days when they didn't write you a ticket knee-jerk and try to hit you as hard as they could. Oh, for the good old days. Isn't, go that the price, isn't that the price of more and more population coming into the island? The more people you have, the more you have to enforce everything that's on the books, rather than having the latitude and the luxury of saying, let this be an educational moment rather than a infraction moment. We have a lot of deterioration of our quality of life in these islands. We don't have time here in the next minute to go into that. But suffice to say, this is not, um, this is not the way it should be. And this is, in my view, another element of the deterioration of quality of life in these islands. Too many tickets, too many people being stopped for silly things, too many experiences in court. As one guy, he's a lawyer of, of great prestige and renown, said to me, you know, how do you judge the interface of the court system and the public? Do you judge that at the Supreme Court? Do you judge that at the Intermediate Court of Appeals? Do you judge that in the Circuit Court, the General Jurisdiction Court? Or do you judge that in the Traffic Court? Answer, oh, traffic yeah. court. Yeah, because it's the first experience. That's where the people meet the system. Right. This was not a good meeting. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I'm glad you did. Say good night, Tim. Good night, Tim. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Jay, for having me on. Thank Appreciate you, Tim. It. Good discussion. Good discussion.